a crusader for the rights of black people all of his life. He has also been a crusader and have had a lot of friends, not only in the black community, but the white community in sports. And uh, he's one of my friends. Over the years, we've done many things together. So Harold is truly a man that believes in his culture and his people and will always be that way because nobody's ever been able to change him. So, <laughs> hey, that's my partner. In the sports world today, everyone claims to be an insider. Harold Bell is the original insider. Washington Times sports columnist Dick Heller says, Harold Bell is the godfather of sports talk, the good kind. He played message music such as Wake Up Everybody by Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, What's Going On by his homeboy and friend Marvin Gaye, and the James Brown classic Black and Proud. He was the first on-air sports talk show personality to write commentaries and the first to host sports media roundtables. Harold Bell is the man for all seasons. He was the first sports media personality to involve pro athletes, politicians, judges, entertainers, and media personalities in his community endeavors. In November 1974, he became the first Afro-American to host and produce his own sports television special in prime time on NBC affiliate WRC-TV4 in Washington, D.C. His special guest, the greatest, Muhammad Ali. I love it. And, you know, they say that our friendship is like our shadows. They're sticking with you as long as you're in the sun, but once you cross over into the shade, the shadow disappears. How do you distinguish your friends? Well, I wrote something once that says, Friendship is a priceless gift that cannot be bought in our soul, but its value is far greater than a mountain made of gold. For gold is cold and lifeless, it can neither see nor hear. In time of trouble, it's powerless to cheer. It has no ears to listen, no heart to understand. It cannot bring you comfort or reach out a helping hand. So when you ask God for gifts, be thankful if he sins. Not diamonds, pearls, or riches, but the love of real true friends. Hey, all right, Mr. Harold Bell. This is Gary Johnson for BlackMenInAmerica.com. Welcome to Speak the Truth, and I turn it over to you, Mr. Bell. Thank you, Gary. Um, first of all, I uh, just want to make it uh, known, in case some people don't know, that uh, I'm celebrating 50 years of inside sports in Washington, D.C., being the voice of sports in Washington, D.C. for the past 50 years, 50 plus years of the voice in the community. So that's, that's what I'm celebrating because there's so many things going on uh, today. And we got so many frauds out there claiming they are doing things and are leaving our children behind. The first thing a politician will say in his campaign speech, children first, <laughs> until they get in the office and then they forget about our children. I want to talk about some things today because uh, I got some history that I want to go back on. And I'm thinking about Wimbledon, the Wimbledon tennis tournament, right? One of the the most famous, largest tennis tournaments in the world. And here we are in 2022. We all, we all know about Venus and Serena. But guess what? It was a blackout at Wimbledon. A blackout. We had no Blacks participating out there in the finals of the semifinals. Coco Golf, I think, was the only one that was out there. And here we are, like I said, 2022, we don't have any Blacks participating in the finals. The closest we got today, it was an Australian brother who looked Black. <laughs> and, he, and he acts Black. <laughs> and Is I'm, he Black? Huh? Is he Black? He's an Australian Black. <laughs> okay, I guess he's Black. He's Black there, that's right. It don't make no difference where you come from. If you're Black, you're Black. You're Black. Yeah. Well, he's not in an American black. I put it okay. Like that, but I love him. And I thought that he could pull it off today, but he gave it away. 
and uh, Novak Dovacek, you know, uh, beat him in uh, three out of four sets, man. He should have gone to a fifth set, but but Nick brew it. But it was a great it was, it was a great tennis match. I love me some tennis. I I would not move from the television today with Nick because it was a great great match, man. Now, pe people got their money's worth. It was no doubt about it. And see, when you start talking about tennis with me. I know everybody know I play football, basketball, and baseball. But after I could not run up and down that court with them young boys, jump with them, I said, I pick, I'm going to pick up a tennis racket. <laughs> I picked up a tennis racket. And that's what I did. So I've been in love with tennis ever since. I have had celebrity tennis tournaments with uh, athletes coming in from all over the country to participate down in Anacostia and celebrity fashion shows. But tennis has always been a great love for me. I forgot about that because you would have those celebrity tournaments. You'd have Ken Beatrice and Donnie Simpson and and man, people from all I over. Saw Earl Monroe, man, yeah. man everybody, man. Everybody. Sponsored by Budweiser and That's right. all, That's all the other places. So tennis has always had, had a place in my heart. But when I stop and, and I look at, at what's happening today, and I go back to when I first uh, attended my first tennis tournament, up at the Evening Star News up on 16th Street. That was 1969. Wow. And guess what? Guess who was playing in it? Arthur Ashe and Jimmy great, Connors. Great Arthur Ashe and Jimmy That was a match there. Yeah, I'm telling you, they couldn't stand each other, man. I know. Stand each other. And here I am. I think I'm the only black up there, really. And we in a tent. You know, this is back in the day. We all gathered in a tent, the, the media and the players. So I spot Arthur Ashe. So I go to a man and, oh, I, I know where I, I was on the air with Petey Green at the time. And that's what I was with. <laughs> I was doing five minutes with Petey Green. So I went up there to get an interview with Arthur Ashe, and I caught him by himself. And I went over and asked him for an interview. The brother brushed me off, man. He didn't have time. I said, what? I said, Whoa, blew me away, man. So I went back. Was it a good brush off or a bad brush off? It was, it was, it was a bad brush off, man. You know. <laughs> oh man. Bad brush off. So I go back over to where I was sitting and try to figure out what's going on. And guess who comes over to me? Jimmy Connors. He said, uh, 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 Hi, I'm Jimmy Carr. I said, man, I know who you are. He said, uh, you want to interview me? Jimmy, I didn't know Jimmy was listening. <laughs> so he said, he said, uh, uh, I said, yeah, man, I'd like, to, I'd like to interview you, man. So he did about a 10 or 15 minute interview with me. So I told him, you know, I had a sports talk show on Sundays, which was the next day. That was a Saturday. And I said, man, I, was like, I would love to have you on the show. He said, well, you know, I'm planning on being in the finals. So can I call you? What time are you on? <laughs> so I gave him my telephone number. And that particular Sunday at WOOK, I had Red R back and his wife Dottie as my as my co-host and my special guest. So now we're sitting there, we we, you know, we talking about a little this and a little that. And the telephone rings, and my producer called Ferguson, peeks in the door, say, Harold, you got a call on line number three. So I said, okay. And I pick up the telephone, and it was Jimmy Connors. I for well, Red all back almost he swallowed <laughs> the guy. He swallowed because Red loved a uh, tennis too, and he was had Daddy in the studio because when they were gonna leave the show, they were going over to 16th Street to watch the Evening Star tennis tournament. And he heard and Jimmy Connors on the on, on the line, man. That that was you talking about, man, a priceless moment. That was right there. Jimmy wow. Connors called into the station, man. So, so when we start talking about tennis, that was 1969. I think, oh, he and, and uh, Arthur Ashe played in the finals. And Arthur beat him for the, for the first ever win at uh, the uh, Evening Star Tennis Tournament. And as you, as you well know, Arthur Ashe went on to Wimbledon, become the first black to win yep. at Wimbledon. And when I stop and think about uh, 1969, how Arthur got in, involved with the National Junior Tennis League. He started this tennis league where, with inner city kids, and he started right here in Washington, D.C., man. He and Donald Dell, who was his like his partner and advisor, started the National Junior Tennis League right here in D.C., and I started Kids in Trouble in 1968. 
So, you know, it was a lot of, it was a lot going on. So now, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Arthur and how Arthur kind of brushed me off. Then I found out he brushed my man Sonny Hill off. Sonny oh, Hill, wow. Sonny Hill was a, one of the uh, analysts, color analysts for the NBA. Yeah. Sonny Hill is sitting at Madison Square Garden, and here Arthur is coming down the aisle, you know, right by the, the where the media is. So Sonny stuck his hand out. Arthur's ass brushed on past him. <laughs> Wow, I guess he's an equal opportunity brush off. Well, you know, Arthur, Arthur, he, uh, you know, came up in Richmond, Virginia, came up during a very difficult time, a lot of segregation, man. And he caught hell, man, you know, trying to play uh, on tennis court. It was a guy by the name Robert Johnson who took uh, Arthur Ashe under his wing. And uh, I want you to show that cartoon of Arthur Ashe when he was a little guy. They did a cartoon on PBS. Check this out. I would like to play in the tennis tournament, please. Sorry, kid. This one isn't for you. Rules are rules. Rules? I don't get it. Arthur is really good. Why can't he play? It's not right, but a lot of parks here separate people based on the color of their skin. No matter how good you are, if you're not white, you're not allowed to play here. But that's a totally unfair rule. I know. I wish they could see that. It's better when we all play together. Maybe one of these days, I'll show them just that. I wonder if Arthur ever does it. You know, help change things. <laughs> Where are we? When are we? Burby says we're in Virginia at another tennis tournament five years later. <gasps> and there's Arthur. Arthur, you're allowed to play with everyone else now? Yes. Today is my first integrated tournament. Watch your favorite shows on your PBS station or anytime. Wow. Yeah. That that was the real, the real, the real in the cartoon. Uh, with Arthur Ashe, and it, and it talked about some of the difficult times that uh, he had coming as a young man in Richmond, Virginia. And we all know about the history of Richmond, Virginia, when it comes to black folks, man. And Arthur had to uh, to leave uh, Richmond uh, to get himself together. And Charlie Brockman and I, uh, we <clears throat> spoke on that because Charlie was with me in 1969. Charlie was up there when the Evening Star Tennis Tournament first took, you know, took root in 1967. And I came after Charlie. And here I am up there in 2008, right? 2008, I'm covering for Inside Sports, right? Guess how many black players are there? We've got one, James Blake. So- Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, James Blake. Let me, yeah. uh, let, let, let me introduce Charlie Brockman to you. Hit that piece. Uh, uh, Gary, that video. All right. Let me uh, pull that one up here as well. Here we go. For one man. You call him the czar, the godfather, or whatever. But this is the man when it comes to public relations. He's a native Washingtonian. A uh, guy went to the D.C. public school system. You know, he got his start in a very peculiar way. He had to leave town. But when he left town, he ran into some friendly fire. Some people that he knew his heroes when he went to Florida, and we're talking about the Washington Senators. He got his first start down there while he was interviewing ball players. The owners came up and found out that he was a native Washingtonian and said, how about coming to Washington? We need a public uh, address system guy to do our ball games. And of course, uh, that is a hell of a way to start <laughs> with the Washington Senators. This guy has been in the business uh, almost 50 years. He started here uh, with the Leg Mason, uh, it was the evening Washington uh, Evening Star tournament back in 1970. It started in 1969. And I'm talking about, like I said, a guy who's been a class act for many, many years, the one and only Mr. Charlie Brockman. How you doing, Charlie? Thank you. That was very nice. Hey, man, I'm give, I want my payoff. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. Charlie, you know, we're looking at 30 years ago, you yep. and I were here. I came three we, years after you. 
when Arthur Ashe first won this tournament, the first African American to win this tournament. Arthur Ashe, Arthur Ashe impact on the pro tennis game from your ringside seat. Spectacular. He would do anything and everything to entertain the fans, to get the kids involved with mm -hmm. tennis. He, I had a situation, many of the folks that are viewing us knows the name Ken Rosewall. Mm -hmm. He's a Hall of Fame tennis player from you know the Wimbledon days and such. And Arthur asked, they were playing here at the Star Tournament. It was a, a semi-final match. Mm -hmm. And the promoters wanted to get the people involved, mm -hmm. activities. Right. And they said, Charlie, can you come up with something? And I said, you know, tennis, unlike any other sport, perhaps unlike uh, baseball or football or basketball, mm -hmm. you can't root and cheer for your favorite athlete. Mm -hmm. Why don't we try and encourage them to do it? And they said, okay, we love that idea. Ask Arthur if he'll do it. I asked Arthur. First thing he said was, it's never been done, Charlie, mm -hmm. and the traditionalists aren't going to like it, yeah. but if you want me to do it, I'll do it. That's I right. says, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Went over to Ken Rosewall and said, Ken, would you do it? He says, absolutely not. No <laughs> way I'm not going to do that. And I said, but Arthur said that he would do it, and he thought it would be entertaining for the fans. Ken Rosewall says, well, if Arthur said it, I don't want to go against him because he's a really nice guy. So, okay, let's do it. But I don't agree with it, and I don't like it. Right. Arthur won the match, and Ken Rosewall didn't speak to me for two years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Charlie, the National Junior Tennis League, that started here, yes, didn't it? That's Tell exactly us about right. that and, and the involvement of, of young people, getting young people involved. You know, one of the things about tennis you can play it at all ages. The National Junior Tennis League, right here in Washington, and we're not talking religions and race, we're talking about kids mm -hmm. playing a game. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you learn is you learn how to lose as well as learn how to win. Mm -hmm. And that's good for an individual. Mm -hmm. And so, we started with literally as you start with just a few kids and then a few more kids and then more adult volunteers moved their way into New York, up the East Coast, down the East Coast, across the country. It's the largest junior tennis in the world. Mm -hmm. It's marvelous. And of course, Arthur Ashe was right in the middle of that. Right. You know, Arthur Ashe won over 800 uh, games. Uh, matches or whatever you yeah. want to call it. He uh, won three Grand Slams. Uh, uh, you're talking about an impact uh, player. That's an impact player. But also, Arthur was uh, had a little rebel in him. They started the ATP. The ball, uh, several of the uh, pro uh, uh, tennis players got yeah. together and started the ATP. Tell us about that and how that came about. Well, what happens, this was in the open era. This was in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And basically, the tennis players themselves says, wait a second, we're the product, we're the performer, mm -hmm. but we're not being paid enough. We can't say where we want to play or when we want to play. There's somebody above us, somebody's always got a boss. Mm -hmm. And so, hey, tennis player, tennis player, tennis player, why don't we form our own union, if you will, mm -hmm. and let's us, we're the performers, we're the ones that people come out to watch. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to put something together, and in fact they did put something together, but because of the uh, officials in the tennis world, mm -hmm. they were at odds with each other for a while, and then they sat down across the table and worked it out better for both. All right. Now, all these big salaries we see today is because of that, of the ATP and Arthur Ashe and that group. That is exactly correct. Mm -hmm. It's just like Billie Jean King and the women's tennis. Mm -hmm. When she first started, she admits that nobody was paying women tennis players anything. Mm -hmm. And she created a team tennis concept. She like Arthur, 
was the foundation mm -hmm. for building professional tennis. They are to be applauded. And I mean, when they were doing their thing, they were not making money. Money, right, that's right. Today, mm -hmm. most of the young tennis players recognize that they were the leaders mm -hmm. of where they are now. But I'm sorry to say that there are some young tennis players mm -hmm. That uh, don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. Now here it is, 30 years later, and we are talking about uh, blacks, African Americans, or whatever you want to call us. But this has been a, a worldwide game, and I see, even though 30 years later, we still only have one black participating in the leg Mason. What is happening? Are our programs working, uh, Charlie, or what? Well, the way I see it is that this is done on an ability. It's, mm -hmm. uh, we don't choose this guy, this guy, or that right. guy to come in. Right, that's if right. If you're the best, right. then you come in. Right. And I'm surprised more and more African Americans are into tennis, mm -hmm. and what happens is that they're getting higher and higher mm -hmm. in the uh, tournament world, and that's why they're starting to play. I think they just literally broken the ice. Right. They're just starting. It's like the Tiger Woods for golf. Mm -hmm. The the African Americans, in, especially in the Washington D.C. area, mm -hmm. we should have half the field African American. That's right. It'd be right. perfect. That's right. Charlie, tell, tell us a little about James Blake, uh, the, the the lone participant that's participating in the Leg Mason and is going to take on Andre Agassi tonight. Anybody who takes on uh, Andre is in for a heap of trouble. <laughs> Andre is spectacular. Let me tell you, when we start talking about this young man mm -hmm. who is going to play the number one tennis player in the world, right. he played last night like he was the number yes, one so player in the world. Right. I couldn't believe yeah. his shots. Mm -hmm. He has to get out fast. Right. He Got can't you. get two or three games behind, he's going to lose his own identity and his confidence in himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Agassi will just run rough shot yeah. right over him. So he's got to start fast. Andre Agassi is one of the most disciplined athletes that I've ever seen. This guy, and talking about remaining focused, I don't think anyone can remain focused as well as Andre Agassi. You're 100% correct. Yeah. Here is a fella, he's an athlete, he is a performer he's a spectacular athlete in that he keeps himself in condition mm -hmm. he eats right he works out right and you're saying that here is a guy who knows his abilities and he just doesn't take it for granted mm -hmm. he works and works and works i saw him out here playing against his wife mm -hmm. <laughs> She's still spectacular. Uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fantastic. She is so good. He is so great. Right, right. You know what's happening? Even Roddick or Agassi, they're playing professional competition here. Mm -hmm. The problem is the competition is really good players. Mm -hmm but they're on another level, another, level, another right. plateau. Mm -hmm. They're not good players, they are spectacular players. Right. And they don't even make some of the uh, matches exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So it, it's, it's wonderful to be out here and mm -hmm. it is a great well, game. Before I let you go, I wanna, you know, I've asked a whole lot of people uh, about Arthur Ashe. A lot of them don't remember that he won this tournament 30 years ago. So I, I think it would be a great service tonight if you remind people that Arthur Ashe won this tournament 30 years ago. We're celebrating 30 years of Arthur Ashe and his impact on the tennis world. He also won the hearts of the people who come to watch mm -hmm. tennis. Right. He was just one wonderful human being who happened to be a terrific tennis player. All right. Well, you heard it from the legend himself, and uh, you're talking about legends of inside sports. This is a legend here because just last year, I honored him 
was a Lifetime Achievement Award from Kids in Trouble, and this is a guy that truly deserves it. So until next time, I'm Harold Bell with the great Charlie Brockman. Thank you, Harold. Okay. All right then, Mr. B. All right. That was uh, great Charlie Brockman. That was 2008 uh, up at the Lake Mason Tennis Center, man, where James Blake was the only black in the tournament. And he met the number one player in the world in Andre Agassi. Now, I also mentioned that 30 years ago, Arthur Ashe won, was the first black to win this tournament. And when Charlie uh, referenced to Andre Agassi out there hitting with his wife, it wasn't just any wife. It was Steffi Graf. I was going to say, she's a, she's a pro. Oh, man, she was big time pro. So when I look back on that history and I look at Wimbledon, and I look what the outstanding job that uh, Zena and uh, I mean Serena and Serena and Venus did with them. Woo, I mean, Richard Williams over the, the tennis world, man. This guy was a genius. And now, of course, you know, look like they done played their time out. Where are the rest of the blacks? That's what I want to know. You know, um, like I said, we had. Uh, Coco Golf, uh, she was there, but the other little girl, uh, she decided to just take off. She's independent. She gonna play when she want to. What's her name, Gary? Osama. Yeah, I know. She had. She was the one who exercised. She needed mental mental thing. Yeah, yeah, but in, for mental health, which was good for mental health. But I, I thought I don't follow tennis, but I thought the feeder group was a look. The bench was a little bit deeper because Venus and Serena was around doing camps and everything. Yeah. And I just thought the feeder group for black kids was would, the bench would be a little bit di would be deeper. Well, you would have thought the same thing uh, for uh, uh, my man in, in golf, for Tiger Woods. Yeah, that's you true. the bench would be a little deeper. But yeah. man, okay, they find a way to, to cut us out. You know, they, they even cut the black caddy out. You can't even find a black caddy now. And I was a caddy. I was, I was say, a yeah. caddy. They don't cut the black caddy out because they made a rule that they had to give 10% of their winning uh, to the caddy. So they say, hey, why should we be giving this money to blacks? We should be giving it to one of our family friends or somebody or our son. So that's the nepotism, what yeah. Doing. And that's why you see uh, these golf tournaments, Miss, a black caddy is a rare, rare thing. So, you know, I'm, that's why I was so interested in Wimbledon because I, I watch them all. And, uh, you know, just to see that James Blake was out there. But guess what? He's an analyst now. Yeah. They had him out there as an analyst. James Blake and, and um, Arthur played a, a great match up there that particular night in 2008. And I just want wanted to take us back and take a look at, at that match. Run that, guy. Is that right after uh, yeah, Brockman? Right yeah. after Brockman. Uh -huh. Coming up. Yes, indeed. There we go. Uh, let's see. Yes.
Gary. Oh, uh, keep it going. Okay. Keep it going. But James Blake uh, just didn't have that killer instinct, I always say. <laughs> and I said that he should have come to the middle much more than Andre. Andre just a Accomplished more off the court, sort of showed everybody what it means to be a humanitarian and paved the way for not just athletes and not just tennis players and not just athletes, right. but for all people to sort of ask themselves, how can I give more, how can I be more? He was a great inspiration to me personally, and I know uh, I can speak for a lot of people that he was a great inspiration to them. He said the table probably for the salaries of the ATP, when they did the players uh, form the ATP back in 69, and I think a lot of players probably remember him for that because he was able to bring the money to the players and brought to the game like yourself. Yeah, he always he always stood for the right things. And, uh, he, was a, he was a good man to be a peer with. I'm, I'm sorry I missed it. Thank you. All right. Uh, James, you played from behind the uh, uh, last uh, couple of matches that you had. And everybody was saying, you know, James can't afford to play from behind on Andre. Mm -hmm. And you stepped to the plate and came out, you know, blasting like Andre said. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he, he rolled back like you did the night before. Yeah, um, like I said, I came out uh, playing as soon as I could. And um, I can't answer. Uh, I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. I came out playing those first few games and I knew win that many points in those. And I knew it wasn't going to go that way the whole time, but I had to try to keep my level up, and I did. I felt like I really kept my level at that, at, uh, at that consistency, playing some of my best tennis, but I said each race is level a little bit above mine. And, um, that's why I'm still number one in the world, and I don't know, one of these days, the loss of time, got it, got it, man. <laughs> 38, man, got it, man, You know, I asked you last year the same question. I said, James, uh, are, you, are you going to you will start coming to the net because of your server? It's such a big server, the quickness that you have, and you said, Harold, gradually that would take place. Yeah. And I watched you play with your brother in, in doubles, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the net play is definitely improving. You see, coming to the net, maybe in the U.S. Open, going to the net more. Yeah, definitely. But I also, um, you know, I have a plan A going into the match, and then you end up having to adjust it depending on who you're playing sometimes. Okay. All right. That was, uh, of course, uh, the great Andre Agassi and James Blake. Uh, I remember when James first came uh, to uh, 16th Street. He's just a young kid with his brother. They played the, uh, doubles together, mom and dad. Uh, mom and dad were an inter interracial couple, and uh, 
his dad was his dad was on top of things, and his dad must have died about three or four years later. And uh, it, he was just such a nice guy, and I really missed him. But James went on to hold his own. Like I say, he's out in Wimbledon now, of course, as a, as an analyst. But you know, you know, when you stop and think, man, we got to think about Arthur Ashe, and we got to also think about Althea Gibson. They were oh, yeah. they, they were the trailblazers. They were the trailblazer. Althea Gibson was the first black woman to uh, win uh, Wimbledon. And of course, uh, nobody, no other black man has won Wimbledon since Arthur Ashe. So we, we got to do, we got to do better. And uh, it was, uh, when, when I th stop and think about, like I said, I so went out and I saw that uh, film on uh, the Williams, uh, Richard Williams and his daughters. Of course, you know, Will Williams uh, won the Academy Award for playing uh, Pops, and he did a great job. He really did. I didn't think he was going to do such a great job, but he deserved that Academy Award. The picture deserved the Academy Award. So we got to do much more uh, to get our young people involved, but it's all about the money. They make the game so expensive to play golf and uh, uh, tennis. So but we, we got to find another way, man, because uh, they're exiting us out. Uh, across the board. When I stop and, you know, think about uh, uh, is Wimbledon colorblind? Is the U.S.? I guess the U.S. Open is colorblind. I guess they got more Blacks participating in that in New York, which I think is the next big uh, uh, Grand Slam tournament. And we don't know whether um, Novak uh, uh, Djokovic is going to be able to play because he never got his shot. Right. He never got his uh, uh, COVID shot, so they didn't let him play in Australia. And uh, so now I think, I don't know if they're going to change the rules or what, but in New York, he cannot play without the COVID shot. So that's, so a lot of people are going to be watching, watching that very, very closely. Um, one of the, one of the other things that um, I want to, I want to talk about too, man, you know, see people don't realize that from the seventies, eighties and nineties, <laughs> I cared to stick in sports media in this town. I was the man. I dominated <laughs> newspapers and everything else. And, and it's so funny that they when, when they do history of Washington, D.C., they, they never mentioned Harold Bell. Not only was I a force in, in sports media, I was a force in the community. I was the first one to ever bring out the pro athletes and the judges, you name them, the politicians. And, and when I look back on that, uh, just recently, and, and, and Gary was a part of this. Uh, That's the Washingtonian piece? From a guy from Washingtonian Magazine was trying to track me down. Yeah. He had, uh, he had heard me on a podcast or something talking about WUST. So he contacted uh, Gary to get in touch with me because Washingtonian Magazine wanted to do something on WUST radio. And, and you're so, former uh, Washingtonian of the year. Yeah, yeah, I was Washington in 1980. <laughs> Evidently, they forgot. But anyway, when I told uh, the young boy, he, he seemed like a nice guy. He was really, he was yeah, he really, seemed, yeah. really a nice kid. I told him the history and who I was. He said, "What?" He said, "Wow." I say from the from 80s in the 90s to 1995, I was the voice of WUST radio. They they played gospel music, but I was the voice. So. Anyway, uh, he turned uh, the story into his editor, and his editor decided they didn't want to recognize me. They didn't want to give me no credit. <laughs> and he was watching Tony the other year. But this is critical race theory that's being practiced in media when it comes to black folks. This is a lot what we call fake news. Fake news. And that's what it is. When, when I stop and, and I look back at Washingtonian Magazine and I look at what's happening. I read another piece, Gary, in, in USA Today. It was in there July 6th. It said, Elvis Presley and Black music complicated. And what, you know what they talked about? Is Elvis Presley stole most of his music from Black musicians. Beast yes. King, uh, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, yep. uh, you name them. He stole, and he went on and, and made millions and millions of dollars and got royalties. And you know how many movies they made of... Uh, 
Elvis Presley since then. This last thing came out. They done made five movies of Elvis Presley and from guys like Chuck Burr and B.B. King and Fast Domino. You know, they don't just say anything about because you know, we're talking major motion pictures in the theaters. Yeah, major motion pictures. <laughs> that's right. We're not talking no documentaries on some uh, streaming service. Yeah. And, and, wow. and it's a shame, man, when I stop and I think. And I look at what Washingtonian magazine also they don't they want they don't want to recognize the history of, of positive black men and women, not just Harold Bell, it's probably us dozens of others that should be on this. You know, PBS has taken the lead in telling black history. They they've they've given uh Ken Burns the go the ghost to be our voice. Ken Burns has has told uh Jackie Robinson story. He has told the Jack Johnson story. He has told the Muhammad Ali story. And I think he's trying to tell the Martin Luther King story. This man has never walked in our shoes and he has become a millionaire through PBS. You know, you're not supposed to be get paid by PBS, but this guy has gotten paid, believe me. And I got to give USA Today credit too. They did run a story on Ken Burns and how unfair PBS has been, of course, they put Louis Gates out there to cover all of black history all over, all over. You understand? He, he's yeah. Mr. Ancestry and Mr. History. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, you stop and think, and I brought something else to Gary's attention. <laughs> I thought, we got, we, got a, we got a bad young lady. Her name is Mickey Guyton. Oh, yeah. Mickey Guyton is a country western singer. <sighs> She had a, a big hit called Black Like Me. And I sent it all over the place because it was so inspiring. You know, I said, here is, man, this is so great, man. And when I checked her history out at the Country uh, Music Awards, she did a song on black hair. This little girl had gotten kick out, kicked out of school for her braids. And yep. Mickey put her out front at the Country Music Awards, man, right in between the tables to talk about how she got kicked out of school. And then Mickey came on with two black girls and they had these big bushes. <laughs> I said, oh my gracious. I said, man, this is another Nina Simone, a beautiful Nina Simone that's gonna tell it like it is. Well, guess what happened? They had, well, they, they named Mickey Guyton uh, the host of um, July 4th, uh, uh, um, the, what was that, Gary? It, it was uh, the Independence Day um, on one of the celebrations on the monument. That's right, on the monument. They made her the host. And I told Gary, I said, oh my gracious, man, Mickey go sing that song, and that's <laughs> going to be, that's going to inspire Black America. <laughs> man, we watched the whole thing. She never sung the song. She yep, never did, sung did. Black Like Me. That's one of her big hits. That's her signature song. That's almost. her signature song. And you know what? I figured it out, man. And they made her an offer that she couldn't refuse. Said, we're going to make you the host. And this will go all around the world. And, but you can't sing Black Like Me. <laughs> and that's it. You know, I wonder, I wonder if we should play Black Like Me for us. Yeah, how about that? Can but, we, you got it, Gary? Let me see here. You, you know, it? because at least... We can do it. Yeah, I got it. Let's okay, do it. Okay, how about playing that? That'd be great. Yeah, let's 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 do that. Whoa! I'm not even a country singer uh, <laughs> fan, but I got to tell you, um, th th that's just good music. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah, it, it, I mean, she said it all. If you think you're free, try to be, be black <laughs> like me. Try to be black like Harold Bell, <laughs> Michael Wilbon, James Brown, hey, Dwayne Bryant, you name it, Sugar Ray Leonard, man, or any un or any unknown person like that brother who was shot, shot sixty, 60 times. times. Shot. 60 times, Gary, they've gone all over that in man. They, they skip over, Gary. 60 times. No weapon on him. I don't care what he did. 60. And, and look, that's just what they found. 
They shot 90. 90 rounds. They shot, they 90, shot 90. 60 hit him. That mean, come on, man. You know, when, when do we say enough is enough, man? When do we say, you know, one, one of the good things about me and uh, my media career, not only was I a legendary sports talk show host, but I wrote for the Washington Post as a freelancer. I wrote for the I wrote for the Washington Times, the Afro American, the New York Amsterdam News, the Bleacher Report. I wrote for all them folks. You understand? So nobody can say, man, who is Harold Bell? But the thing is, I didn't let anyone get away or write anything negative about me. If they said something negative about me, I jumped on a case. And one of those guys that did that was at the city paper, man. My man, uh, Dave McKenna. I was putting on a, a, a thing for Earl Lloyd, trying to get him inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I invited all these celebrities out to um, Bowling Air Force Base. I had Earl Lloyd there. I had uh, James Brown, Sam Jones, George Knox. I mean, it was a flock of us out there, man, to pay tribute. And this guy never even interviewed me, Dave McKinnon. I didn't know who he was. And he wrote an article saying, you know, so many negative things about me that people like Sugar Ray Leonard and Don King didn't want to be anywhere near me. They would have been there. And I said, man, what is this guy talking about? I was so teed off, I wrote to City Paper, and they allowed me to do, uh, what they think, uh, retract the story and, and put it in the City Paper. And I, and I like Dave McKinnon. He's been out for several. He's wrote a, uh, another story on me, you know. But, man, he's never said, hey, Harold, I should have done that. So, you know, I, I can't forgive that. Sugar Ray Leonard and James Morton. They did a story in the LA Times with Earl Gusky. I had Earl Gusky on my show right after that. They put in there that I uh, they had left me behind and, and he had cut his brother and everybody loose for the championship fight with uh, uh, Tommy Hearns. And I was one of the, the folks that was um, the hang-ons and that uh, I had asked Ray for a job. And that, I mean, I ain't never asked Ray for a ticket, a dollar, a job or nothing. But Ray and Jinx Morton allowed Mike Train and them to get their hands together to put that in the L.A. Times. Now, anybody that read that in the L.A. Times, they don't know Harold Bell. They said, who is this fool, man, Judge of Sugar Ray Leonard? But this is the kind of mentality that we deal with when we got the Sugar Ray Leonard, when we got the James Browns, when we got uh, uh, the Michael Wilbon, the, the, the Dwayne Bryant. You understand? We are a selfish bunch of individuals, and that's why our kids' blood is flowing not only in the streets now, it's flowing in our classrooms. And these politicians, man, they, they are bad news. And speaking of politicians, uh, Gary, did you see where they kicked uh, Boris Johnson uh, to the curb uh, as prime minister in, in the UK? Yeah, he's gone. He's gone. And what about the prime minister that got assassinated, the, the Japanese prime minister, former prime minister? That, I mean... <laughs> That's shocking in a way because he's been there so long, but they don't have gun violence problems. That's right. You know, over there. So that really is striking uh, the way he was assassinated, you know? Yeah. Um, this, they say this guy went around the system. He built his own gun. They say he built, but the thing, oh. the thing that blew me away is that the first shot didn't hit anyone. And, and the prime minister was standing there almost alone, seemed like he would have ducked or somebody would have knocked him down or something. The second shot killed him, man. So that, 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 was, that was really bad news, man. But when I, when I stop and, and think, man, about you know, what's going on around us, Gary, we got a lot of, this, it's voting time in Washington, D.C. So what are we gonna do, Gary? We're gonna put those same politicians back in there again to do the same old things over and over again. It's almost like around the country. People, it, it's any time people should get the wake-up call about how important your local vote is, it is now. Because yeah. you see now with these uh, investigations of January 6th, mm -hmm. all these local people had influence. And thank goodness, most of them did not do you know, what Trump was trying to get them to do. Like, oh, just give me 11,000 votes, you know, or mm -hmm. just toss these votes in the trash. Um, no, we got to, it's local. Yeah. Well, man, I, I just, um, man, I, a lot of people here, Gary, I know you you moved to Florida now, but a lot of people in this area, man, they are not happy about going to vote, man. 
Now, I think this may be one of the, the poorest turnouts in history, man. Black when it comes to black voters. Who, who Who's up there? I mean, nobody is energized in the base. All of them are thieves and crooks, man. You got the Glenn Ivins, you got Donna Evans, you got Calvin Harris, you know, you got Bowser, we got Eleanor Holmes, Norton, all the same old people, man, that who, who say every time one of our kids get killed, enough is enough. But Eleanor Holmes is sitting there for 50 years since uh, uh, my man, uh, Carmen Walter Farnsworth left, and Bowser's in there for a third time because there was nobody on the horizon to, to beat her. But really what they should do, she got to go up against the Republican, the Independent. They should even vote for one of them right now just to teach her a lesson, man, because she has sold us out, man. People need to vote their interests. Yeah. I don't know why they are so hung up, but uh, like you said, and I quoted you in something I was doing, I have to pull it out, but because uh, I haven't posted it yet, but I'm like, I quoted you directly, what you say at the end of the show. I'm not going to spoil it because yeah. you say about <laughs> about your friends and right. color. That's right. But, That's but right. people need to vote their interests. So if somebody is of a different party than I'm affiliated with, but they are voting or they are doing things that are in the interest of me and my children, you get my vote. Yeah, that's right, man. I just, I just hate to, to see, man, that uh, we don't, we don't, people have lost their lives, man. Got hung by their necks, assassinated in their homes, fighting for the vote. And here we got people coming along, man, that, you know, saying it, saying it wasn't important, man. It was not important. So, I got as, as a friend of mine running down by the name of, of Matt. He's a in fact, girl, you met him, uh, the U.S. Marshal. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 fall. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Matt, Matt, man, would make a great uh, politician who will stand up. But he, you know, he just doesn't have the money, man, or, or the juice to get out. Get, he didn't get out there early enough because he is definitely be better than any Glenn Ivey or Donna Edwards or uh, uh, Calvin Harris or uh, any of them, because he's had a background of standing up for people, man, putting his life on the line. It is a challenge to get, because you need money. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess you, the truth is you do need money, but some people do get elected without the money in some parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's like a money machine. Yeah. And then once you get into the money machine, then they, they buy you, they own you. They own you, that's right. They own you, man. They, they own you. My my wife gave me something uh, I wanted to mention at the end of the show. I can't even think of it, but it was a great, great saying, man. But uh, I did, I just want to say, man, that we got to we we got to come forth, man. We we cannot keep condoning what's going on in our community, especially with our senior citizens and our children, man. And and like like Gary said, I, what I say at the end of each show, man, that every black face you see. It's not your brother, and every white face is not your enemy. And I learned that by trial and error. And uh, as we go out of here uh, for another Zoom Sunday, you know, I want to keep everybody in prayer, and everybody keep me in prayer, uh, because we got we we got an uphill battle, man. It's I mean, it's getting it's going like that now. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, so that's what we got to do, man. And just remember. Thanks again, Gary, uh, for putting this to help put this together. But I just remember, you cannot soar with eagles if you go hang out with chickens. And we got a bunch of chickens running for office. Until next Sunday, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone. All right, Mr. B. Till next time. See ya. See ya.